Okay. My name is Claudia Ringler and I'm with the International Food Policy Research Institute and I welcome everyone to today's session at Amkau Water and Sanitation Week on groundwater governance. Rural groundwater development is an important intervention to accelerate agriculture and overall economic growth, fight climate change and generate employment in rural Africa. However, there is considerable risk of groundwater overdraft and depletion. Groundwater overdraft has already put a large share of food production in India at risk of failure. To address this, India has implemented a variety of approaches, including top-down, for example, through financial incentives for states that can reduce overdraft, and bottom-up, for example, crop irrigation scheduling tools used directly by farmers. This session introduces a groundwater governance tool that is being scaled to seven Indian states and is also currently being tested in Ethiopia and Ghana under the USAID supported Small Scale Irrigation Innovation Laboratory to assess to what extent it can and has changed farmer behavior, groundwater institutions and sustainability in use. Without further ado, I would like to direct you to our opening poll on what measures you think are most impactful for managing groundwater. You should be seeing this poll coming up on your screen right now. So please click on as many responses as you find applicable to this question. So the question again is, what measures are most impactful for managing groundwater? So you'll, we have one minute uh, to answer this poll. And we have basically five possible response options. Okay, let's give it uh, 15 seconds more. So what measures are impactful to manage groundwater, given that this is a resource that is increasingly used for all human uh, purposes, irrigation, domestic and industrial water use. Okay, so let's uh, look at the response, please. Okay, so there is two front runners here, a cap on water quantity and number of wells to stop overuse and a direct support to farmer uh, rules and bylaws for such local rules. And okay, there's a strong belief we can do something about it. And uh, no measure is impactful, got a, a total of zero votes. So that's, uh, that's great to know. Um, and so let's uh, move to our next agenda item, uh, a, a country where that has become famous for groundwater overdraft and also has done a lot uh, to address this challenge. So I would like to now introduce Dr. Alok Sika. He's the country director at the International Water Management Institute and formerly deputy director for natural resources management at the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And he will tell us why groundwater use in India is under threat and what is being done about it. Uh, please do uh, use the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask any questions you might have to Dr. Sika. There's also a Q&A function. If you want, you can use that, but feel free to use either of these two functions. So Dr. Sika, so what's, what's happening in India and why? All right, thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for giving me this chance. <clears throat> and uh, so let me begin by saying that, yes, the, as you very rightly mentioned, that the Indian uh, irrigation economy in India is overwhelmingly groundwater dependent. And uh, it has also given a boost to bringing in the green revolution and uh, also the food self sufficiency where we are today. Of course, Besides many other uh, uh, factors, this is this being one of the most prominent one. And let me also start by saying that uh, the country as a whole, uh, the groundwater is really not threatened or stressed. 
it's uh, but yes in many many parts of the country it is under the severe stress and particularly as a result of groundwater over exploitation and also at places because of the groundwater quality and uh, as you wanted to know why it is really so the case i mean there there are a number of reasons that uh, which answer the question that why it is so much of groundwater is stressed. To begin with, let me say that because traditionally there has been a lot of canal or the surface irrigation, but increased dependence on groundwater has really been there for the last four decades. And as a result of reduced public investments in canal irrigation and the aging infrastructure and the lack of operation and maintenance. And this is, as I said, reflected in the past decays that 84% of the irrigated area in India has been added by groundwater and which comes from about 22 million working uh, wells and the tube wells and uh, drawing something like close to 245 billion cubic meters of water. So now this is something that uh, really has been now supporting about 63% of the net irrigated area of India is supported by groundwater. So one can imagine but of course, at the same time, it has also led to the fact that uh, about 20% of the blocks in the aquifers are now overexploited, means are critical, where the annual discharge, which is pump being pumped out, is much more than the annual natural recharging, which is taking place. So this has really led to a serious concern. The other reasons are, of course, uh, the free and the highly subsidized electricity for groundwater pumping, which is especially more so in the groundwater stressed states or parts of the country. And uh, it has been also led by the other drivers which were there, of course, the advances in pumping irrigation technology and affordable pumps, they comes with the government subsidy. That's, that was the kind of a plus thing which really incentivized and everything came up. The another area of concern, which is really taking place is the unsustainable uh, cropping pattern, which is more loaded in the favor of high water demanding crops like rice, sugar cane, and some other water demanding crops, particularly in the water stressed areas, because which are otherwise the groundwater is stressed. And this is, there are certain concerns in some places about the geogenic contamination like arsenic and others triggered by again, over exploitation. And I would also put it uh, a lack of some kind of policy coherence because free electricity and on top of that, we are got the minimum support price for the certain crops. So I think those are also kind of the factors which are really adding to some of these kind of issues which are really coming up at some of these already stressed uh, groundwater stress areas. Because as we know, typically the Northwestern part of the India is more groundwater stressed as opposed to the uh, eastern part, because the eastern part you have still far more better groundwater situation. Uh, then, of course, there has been a competing water demands, and uh, because from many, many other sectors, and also on top of it, the low water use efficiency and water productivity, which, because we have been traditionally focusing on the supply side argumentation and far more less attention on the demand side water management, which is really now picking up and everybody knows now that this is the demand side management, which is really to be looked into. And for the last decade or so, or more than that, it's a climate change. Now the changing climate, particularly when it is marked by frequent and intense hydrological uh, extremes, which poses yet another threat to groundwater in terms of its recharge, deficient recharge, and also amplifies the groundwater use due to increased demand because of the high ET demand. So that's kind of increases the supply demand gap. And so this is another kind of a cause which has really become a serious concern. So that's keeping all these things in the view as Claudia was asking me, the government has taken a number of, or a series of initiatives and the measures for groundwater recharge, artificial groundwater recharge, managed aquifer recharge, and participatory groundwater management. Very recently, they come with the Atal Bhujal Yojana, where you have a participatory groundwater management, including the demand side management. 
which also includes the crop diversification and incentivization for that to manage the already stressed situation and take measures, similar measures in the other areas. So I think this is kind of in a brief, which I could say from my side in three or four minutes. So Claudia, over to you. Yeah, perfect. I think you've given us really <clears throat> a great overview of all of the reasons of why ground, groundwater is overdrafted in parts of India, but severely in parts of India. And at the same time, some of the important measures that the government is undertaking, including crop You are not audible. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I missed that. So, yeah. So you gave us a great, uh, I think, a great overview of the many reasons of why groundwater is being overdrafted um, in northwestern India and many of these measures that the government is undertaking. And it sounds like the government is increasingly moving towards demand side management practices and, and, and instead of <laughs> supporting additional groundwater extractions. Excellent. We'd like to now move on and hear um, from Ms. Pratiti Priya Darshini. She is with the Foundation for Ecological Security and has been involved in scaling social learning interventions to stimulate groundwater governance in several Indian states. Um, and she has a pre-recorded intervention. And again, please add your questions to Ms. Priya Darshini also in the chat. And Michael, if you could uh, show Mrs. Uh, Priyadarshini's intervention, thank you. So I'll just briefly talk about um, and reflect on some of the experiences of uh, using experiential learning methods and tools to facilitate social learning around commoning water. And so as a shared resource, we all know the, that uh, water is a shared resource. It is highly subtractable. It is, uh, and there are multiple users, there are multiple uses. And as Swapniji also shared, there are multiple resource systems which are connected to water, water resources. And the challenge has been that there has been a lot of investments on improving the surface water supply. But over a period of time, these benefits have failed to sustain. And one of the key reasons behind this is because of lack of coordination amongst the users, especially at the local level, to ensure provision and regulate withdrawals. So as practitioners, the question that we really face is what are the innovations that we need to bring about to improve water management using a bottom-up approach? So these are some of the tools that we have been using in uh, hundreds and thousands of villages where we are working both directly as well as with partner NGOs and government partners. So the first one is around the experimental games. The experimental games builds on uh, game theory and it emphasizes on the shared nature of resource and um, of uh, especially of groundwater. So the game is about um, two crops and it is played with a group of five participants wherein the players have to select uh, between a high water intensive and high earning crop vis-a-vis -vis a crop which does not use a lot of water but at the same time it does not it is not very uh, profitable also so this particular game mainly it helps in sensitizing communities in understanding that if i extract water from my borewell well or well then it reduces the availability of water for the others and similarly it's the same thing that happens for my neighbors also so this is one of the tools that we are using to uh, especially to trigger discussions around demand management of water. The second tool that we have been using is the crop water budgeting. Uh, this is a farmer centric tool. Again, a lot of participatory rural appraisal exercises are used to, to conduct this kind of an exercise. And this uh, mainly focuses on estimating what is the water available in the village and what is the demand. So this is typically um, um, conducted before the rabi season, which is when the, uh, the farmers grow for, uh, grow for irrigated crops. So this exercise is conducted before that so that they can get an idea or a shared understanding of the total water balance in their village and then take decisions and decide on different kinds of uh, crops or varieties that needs to be uh, grown in their village on a shared platform. The third tool, this addresses more of a supply side issue. But uh, so we know that pros of money is invested under MG and REGA for constructing different kinds of water harvesting structures or for soil moisture conservation activities. 
but a lot of times uh, these activities are not really well planned and these are not driven by data or uh, data about the location specific data around say land use land cover or soil type or lithology so this composite landscape assessment and restoration tool this is a gis based tool it can be used offline by neo literate or semi literate people as well and it's a color coded uh, tech platform which can guide people to uh, to decide on what kind of interventions can be planned in which specific location depending on the recharge and the whether that area falls in a recharge zone or if that area falls in a discharge zone so this is the third tool and the fourth one is around uh, its uh, community based system dynamics it again it draws it's uh, draws from the research around system dynamics and it is these exercises are conducted with the community members and this is mainly to understand the interconnections between different resources as you can see in this map which we uh, which was developed with the community members in Rajasthan and uh, it also helps in visualizing not just the immediate changes that will happen say because of uh, a shift in the uh, in in or taking up more of cash crops but also in the long term what is the what are the repercussions of the decisions that we will that we are taking as farmers or as community members so this helps in visualizing both the immediate as well as the uh, long term changes so these are the four tools that uh, i wanted to share about and we can get into the decisions and the basically the stories of change in the later half of this webinar thank you yeah, thanks to uh, Ms. Priyashini's presentation on some of the bottom-up measures that are being taken in India to address groundwater governance challenges. We are now moving into Sub-Saharan Africa, and we have a first intervention by Hagar El Didi. She's with the International Food Policy Research Institute, and she'll explain to us the more technical details behind the social learning intervention for groundwater governance and its application in Ethiopia. This work was done jointly with Dr. Fikadu Kela, who is now with the Water and Land Resources Center at Addis Ababa University. So Michael, if you could share uh, Ms. LDD's intervention, please. Hello everyone, my name is Hagar El Didi. I'm presenting on behalf of my team from IFPRI and Haramian University in Ethiopia on experiential learning, a groundwater games and collective action in Ethiopia. So similar to all commons, some of the groundwater challenges include high subtractivity. So one person's use reduces groundwater for others and low excludability. The boundaries are difficult to establish. But also particular to groundwater is low visibility. It's difficult to identify aquifer boundaries and depth, and resource dynamics are complex. Groundwater declines are not directly visible to, to users, and many users share the same resource without, without realizing their interconnectedness. The use of groundwater for irrigation on a large scale is a recent phenomenon in central Ethiopia. It has picked up particularly during the last five to 10 years. Um, both the government and international programs are promoting the extensive use of groundwater to improve livelihoods, but farmers have not yet faced a dramatic reduction in groundwater levels. But because small-scale irrigation is expanding, this presents a good opportunity to improve farmers' understanding of how they, through collective action, can prevent groundwater depletion in the future before reaching clearly visible or alarming levels, uh, as in other countries such as in India, where these experimental games were piloted. So what are behavioral games? Um, they're sometimes lab or in our case of framed field experiments, typically involving a social dilemma. Generally, as experiential learning is the process of learning by doing or through experience and reflection and hands-on learning. And why, why do we play games? It, they've been seen to be useful tools for identifying patterns in thinking and behavior and shaping mental models as well as uh, being able to simulate several seasons or years in a short time and see the effects of different institutional arrangements, such as rules. And villages where games were played in India were significantly more likely to adopt rules for groundwater governance. So you wanted to test that in Ethiopia. 
So in this study, we implement a groundwater governance game originally developed for India in Ethiopia to assess the potential of using game intervention to help raise awareness of groundwater depletion and improve understanding of the importance of collective action uh, around groundwater. Our research questions included to what extent can the intervention change individual mental models to address governance challenges, and to what extent does this intervention actually simulate conversations among community members around improving governance, and to what extent this awareness raising and, and discussions actually lead to actions on the individual user level and the community level, um, as well as looking at some gender differences uh, in learning and group dynamics. Um, our study area was grand groundwater irrigation communities in four districts of the Tetra near central Ethiopia. We used mixed methods in our design and our sampling frame included 39 kabelis or villages in four districts or waledas using groundwater for irrigation. And we select 15 treatment and 15 control kabelis. We choose then five men and five women from each village to play the game in disaggregated groups. Uh, and then um, we have we invite the village for a, a community debriefing as well as a focus group discussion. So the game is played in groups of five. Players choose either crop A or crop B. Uh, to cultivate, crop A is a water saving crop that yields less income and we choose locally relevant crops such as carrots or cabbage that are water saving in the area and crop B is a water demanding crop that yields higher income such as onions. Um, players make their decisions individually and the facilitator then shows the collective effects of players' choices on the groundwater level and announces recharge from rain. There are multiple rounds, each representing a year and different treatments, like without communication, with communication, and with group elected votes. Then we look at the community debriefing, um, where farmers discuss how this relates to their own experiences and challenges in farming, uh, the lessons they could learn from this experience and possible solutions. Um, so the analysis is still ongoing, but our early results show some exciting initial evidence of social learning effects. So if we look at the orange bars here, we could see that um, surface water rules are more common in communities compared to groundwater rules. Um, and most communities who have a surface water rule is just about um, the fact that they are mm, prohibited from redirecting the rivers or canals or building a dam. Uh, and then fewer, few communities had any groundwater related rules. We could see that in the blue bars. And those who did have a groundwater rule most commonly was just about uh, the fact that they're not allowed to dig more than one well on one land. And as shown in yellow, few communities believed that there should be any rules governing water, especially groundwater. So they... um, in the first non-communication game, women started out extracting more groundwater for irrigation than men, but communication also helped closing this gap. And this is consistent with expectations that communications and, rule, and rules help. And in general, players improved with communication, but this is seen more clearly uh, with women. Uh, in the third game, which was the most exciting game where players were able to elect rules, um, nearly all the groups chose to introduce some rules uh, to manage water use. And these uh, were mostly things like crop rotation, so all players choose crop A in year one and then crop B in year two and so on, or player rotation, where player one and two cultivate the higher income crop this year and then the next year, year players three and four could do so and so on. Um, most, elect, most of the groups elected a leader uh, to monitor their choices and to sometimes elect their, their rules, but more uh, female groups were actually tended to elect a leader. Uh, and most groups um, chose to impose some sort of sanction. Mostly they were monetary sanctions on average around 300 bear, but they were very variable. Some groups had low and some of it much higher uh, monetary sanctions. But some other sanctions were non-monetary, like social isolation or uh, bans on cultivating uh, or using irrigation water. And some groups also chose some progressive sanctioning where 
uh, first they could give advice and then the second violation they would introduce uh, a sanction and then a higher sanction and so on. There were uh, more violations we saw in uh, to the group rules in women's games as you can see from this first table, but there were also less fines introduced in women's games. So those who did not always enforce the rules or find the violator tended to be more forgiving. Um, most more groups had uh, reactive rules um, where they monitor the water levels and reach uh, and like react to a change in the rules accordingly. So when the water declines, they switch to water saving and when water increases, they allow cultivation of de demanding crops where other groups chose to just fix their rule regardless of uh, water level. Um, here, players were asked to agree or disagree with some statements in a short survey before and after uh, the game. So in the first two tables, we see that the perceptions changed in the correct direction as we, that we expect. So more people believe that the current groundwater use will affect the sustainability of the resource and more people believe that uh, there is a need for rules or, um, or disagree with no need for rules uh, and not much change for this statement that communities need collective action to establish and maintain uh, water. Here we see after the game many people mentioned that crop rotation should be done uh, as well as collective action should be taken. Uh, note here some gender differences. On the other hand, fewer people mentioned that deeper wells should be dug to uh, to improve water availability, although the number was still quite substantial. Still went down to almost half the men and the women. Additionally, many people maintained the importance of soil and water management uh, or afforestation after having played the game, and that's especially for men. Likely men are maybe more exposed to the government-backed soil water management programs. Um, here we see that participants overwhelmingly reported that the game is fun, relatable, and educational, which is great. And we see some testimonials showing that what resonated with the participants as a learning lesson. And it's good to see that some perception change for community members were uh, where previously rules were non-existent and people thought that rules are not needed, that they changed this perception, like in the first quote here. Um, in an open-ended question about lessons learned, we see that many reported that they realized the importance of collective action and communication, as well as the need for rules. And more men reported learning this through the game. Both men and women learned how to manage the resource sustainably, also which crops are water intensive, uh, the link with the crops and choices and uh, ground level, groundwater level. Uh, more women than men mentioned this. Some men realized groundwater is a common resource. Some mentioned the trade-off between revenue and water consumption. And some actually mentioned that water must be protected for the future generation. And that was more frequently men. Now, uh, we see that in conclusion, there were already some social learning effects that we could see uh, of immediate learning on the individual and community levels. Most communities viewed the games as a good learning event and have a better appreciation and understanding of groundwater as a common pool resource. This is a work in progress. So our next step will be to carry out more analysis on community characteristics, the relationship among players, production asset and market participation, and factors affecting crop choices. We will also analyze the end line um, and control communities data to test longer term effects of the games on the mentor models and groundwater governance. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. I think this was a great overview of how groundwater governance, social learning interventions can be and have been implemented in Ethiopia. But to now uh, really live, live this kind of experience, we have also developed a movie that was done as part of the end line um, of this pilot intervention in Ethiopia. And I'm asking Michael to quickly show us this movie before we move on to Ghana. So Michael, please.
Groundwater is a common pool resource that is rapidly depleting in many places around the world. The increased demand for more nutritious crops and animal source foods, as well as more affordable well drilling technologies and cheaper pumps, have increased pressure on limited underground resources. With limited state capacity to regulate groundwater extraction, Collective action is important for sustainably managing groundwater resources in groundwater hotspot areas. Water resources in southern nations, nationalities, and people's region of Ethiopia are generally abundant to support irrigation expansion if managed sustainably, which could result in improved incomes, livelihoods, and nutrition for millions of people. But despite ample water resource potential, groundwater recharge might well not be sufficient to meet the growing demand. Small-scale irrigation is becoming increasingly popular and pressure on groundwater resources is growing. Behavioral games that stimulate real-life resource use have shown promise as a social learning tool for improving resource governance. They are useful for identifying patterns in thinking and behavior, testing management options, as well as shaping mental models and understanding of relationships both among users and between users and the resource. An innovative use of collective action games which simulate crop choice and impacts on aquifers engages the community to improve local understanding of groundwater interrelationships and stimulate collective governance of groundwater. The groundwater game is not a silver bullet, but instead complements existing participatory activities in order to empower communities to self-govern their common resources. It works as catalyst to encourage discussions in the community, to prepare water management rules, and strengthen local governance. Importantly, no right actions or rules are imposed on community members. They themselves discuss and prepare their own strategies as this will more likely lead to actual behavioral change. The game is designed to be used by field staff of NGOs, government extension services, or other facilitators in community natural resource management processes. In each village, the groundwater game is played with a group of five men and another group of five women separately. The game takes them through multiple rounds, each representing a year where they can experience in a short period of time how choosing between a crop A, low water use, low income, and crop B, high water use, high income, influences groundwater levels, and how each person's choice affects the overall resource. <laughs> An essential step is the community-wide debriefing which takes place after the game, where community members get together and discuss lessons learned from the game and how this relates to their real life and resource use. <laughs> መጀመሪያ ደረጃ በድብቅ የምንወያ የምንሰራውን የሰራ ሂደት በድብቅ እንሰራለን በሁለተኛው ደረጃ ደግሞ ታውያይታን አንድ ላይ አምስታችን ታውያይታን የምንሰራውን የሰራ ሂደትን እናስተዋውቃለን በሶስተኛ ደረጃ ህገደም እናወጣለን የራሳችን የሆነ ህገደም አውጥተን ማለት ከዘፊት ጉርጋዱ ወደ 12 ሜትር ነበር ውሃ የሚገኘው ከዛ መስኖ መጠቀም ከጀመርንበት ወዲ የዋር ይቀት እየጨመረ እየሄደ አሁን ወደ 15 ሜትር ላይ እየተገኘ ነው ውሃው እና ከዚህ ፊት እየተጠቀመ በነበር ነው ሰዓት ሽንኩርት እየሰራው የውሃ እጥረት እየገጠመ ነበር ከዛ አሁን በተማርኩት በእውቀት መሰረት ጎመን አሁን ለመስራት ቻያለሁ በዚህ ጎመን የውሃውን መጠን በአግባቡ እየተጠቀምኩ ነው መጀመሪያ ይያልነበረው የውሃ መጠን አሁን በአግባቡ ይያገኘው በሶስት ደረጃ ነው ያየነው የጫውታውን አይነት አንደኛው 
ሰው በፍላጎቱ የትኛው ነገር እየሰራ የነበረበት ሂደት በአንደኛ ዙር በሁለተኛ ዙር ደግሞ በመወያያት ስራውን እየሰራን የምንሰራውን የስራውን መስክ መርጠን እየሰራን ነበር በዛም ደግሞ ያስቀመጥነውን የስራውን ሂደት የምትስ አካል ነበረ ያንን ደግሞ በሶስተኛ ዙር ላይ ያንን ሰው በመሰብሰብ መስራት ያለበትን ነገር ባለ መስራቱ በሶስተኛ ደረጃ ላይ ደም ባስቀምጠን በቅጣት መልክ በሶስተኛ ደረጃ ቅጣት እየቀጣን ስራውን በአግባቡ እንድሰራ ያረጋግ ነው ጫውታው ላይ ውሃ የሚቆጥቡ ሰብሎችን ተጠቅሜ በእርሻው ላይ ደግሞ አሁን ውሃን የሚቆጥቡ ሰብሎችን እየተጠቀምኩት ነው ከዚህ ፊት በሚጠቀመው በሰብል አይነት ውሃንና ግዜን ገንዘብን እንደሚጎዳ አላቅም ነበር ባገኘሁት ከጫውታው እውቀት አሁን ግን ሰብሉንም ምርጫይን በማድረግ ውሃውንም በመቆጠብ ገንዘብንም በመቆጠብ ግዜውንም በመቆጠብ ተጠቃሚ ሆኛለሁ Okay so I hope that this uh, movie is maybe stimulating some of you to also get engaged in interventions to improve uh, groundwater governance in whichever african or other country you're working in and are based in so we are now moving to Ghana with a quick intervention by Dr Emmanuel Obobi He is a senior research scientist at the Water Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana and he has recently undertaken a situation analysis towards introducing a groundwater governance pilot in northern Ghana so Emmanuel if you could tell us a little bit of why uh, such an intervention might also be useful in northern Ghana and what you have been finding so far please Uh, Dr. Obobi. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia, and uh, thanks to all the rest that are online. So, um, northern Ghana um, is characterized by um, a short period of rainfall, so about five months of rainfall, uh, and the rest of the year, which is seven months, um, is dry. So, um, most of the surface water. bodies um dry out shortly after the the rainfall period uh, except for the main uh, major river channels that still have water flowing in them throughout the year and because of that the, there's a heavy dependence on groundwater uh for um domestic water supply uh, but also for um irrigated uh, agriculture um including crop production and livestock watering um in the last few years um the extent of groundwater irrigation um has significantly increased um the irrigators abstract water from both uh, shallow groundwater and deep groundwater um but in more recent years the abstraction from deep groundwater um has intensified uh and the number of farmers that are now um lifting water from depth of between 70 and 100 meters using motorized pumps uh, that are powered by electricity uh, have increased um even though we are not yet at the point where the groundwater level is significantly lowered because of the increasing number of farmers uh, that practice groundwater irrigation um we we need to look at managing the the practice or the resource Uh, more sustainably uh, so that we avoid uh, the challenge of falling into a trap where um, the use of the resource becomes unsustainable because in that regard then it has effect on uh, the livelihood uh, activities of the people um groundwater irrigation is 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 very profitable to the people uh, uh, based on uh, our analysis and past studies is very clear that uh the practitioners of groundwater irrigation uh, and more income uh from the practice than what they get from main uh rain fed agriculture uh and aside that it also boosts uh, food security uh in the region uh, but in the country as a whole because some of the the produce are cut by middlemen all the way from the production site uh, to other parts of the country 
uh, it also helps to deal with the issue of uh, seasonal migration uh, between the north and the south, uh, because then uh, it offers some form of livelihood activity that retain people um, or much of the youth uh, within that region. Um, otherwise, then uh, they would have had to migrate to find other jobs to do during the um, the uh, non-rainfall uh, season. Um, there are governance arrangements in place for managing groundwater um, and surface water uh, at the national level uh, and then at the, the basin level. The unit of water management in Ghana uh, is the basin level uh, at the moment. Uh, in some of the river basins, you have sub-basin level management um, where uh, the managers then connect to community level management by engaging the community level people uh, in the management of the resource. But in Northern Ghana, um, that practice has not yet uh, reached there. It's currently being piloted uh, in one of the, the main uh, river basins in the, in, in the water basin in the region. And therefore, currently there is a, a, a gap in management between the river basin level and community level. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you visited the communities where groundwater irrigation is practiced, um, the practitioners are basically on their own. Um, they are individuals um, who are into the practice. They, they have no association uh, and they, they have no rules. They have no regulations. They have no uh, traditional arrangements uh, for managing the resource. So they use their own discretion um, they they construct wells um, as they they wish on their own plots uh, without recourse to whatever effect it has on on their neighbors in terms of drawing down the water table. Um, and because of that, um, for some of the areas, they are unable to complete the cropping season uh, without having stress to the crops. Uh, some of them in the middle of the cropping season, they run out of water because the groundwater table goes below uh, what they can afford to abstract because they do the abstraction manually. They drill the well themselves. They sort of follow the water table as it goes down, but at the point then they are no longer able to assess it. And then the, the, the crop stress and they, they lose them entirely in some instances. Uh, and because of that, some of the farmers that can afford now have drilled deeper wells to abstract and they have um, motorized their abstraction so they can get enough water to irrigate. So there is a real concern, uh, even though presently it's not a, a challenge, uh, but looking at the growing numbers of people involved in that, uh, it's important to have uh, some community level governance arrangement in place to do that. And I think there's a lot we can learn from what has happened in the uh, uh, in Ethiopia and India, uh, and the, the interventions that have been shown by colleagues online uh, have the potential to help bridge that gap to support these communities that use groundwater for irrigation to have in place some sort of rules and arrangements that help them to sustainably use the resource so that their livelihoods are protected uh, and sustained going into the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. I think a great overview of the situation in northern Ghana, uh, farmers, you know, really being basically left to their own devices and, of course, very interested in exploiting groundwater resources and I think to some extent um, ready uh, for looking into social learning interventions. So I think in, in about a year or so, we can uh, report on the final results from Ghana and, and compare with Ethiopia. So I think that'll be exciting. And so maybe we'll, we'll do another event then. We now move into the panel discussions uh, and I'll be asking you know, direct questions to our esteemed panelists. And please audience, there are some questions already in the chat, but feel free to add additional questions and feel free to ask your questions to the entire audience. So not just to the panelists. So because there could be others in the audience who might be able to help you with your questions. But let's now move uh, 
to our first uh, esteemed panelist from the private sector. Um, Mr. Joseph Mensa is the project manager um, for PEC Africa in Ghana. And he is in particularly supporting the uh, Feed the Future Innovation Lab for small scale irrigation in accelerating um, the uptake um, of solar irrigation pumps in Ghana, but probably also Northern Ghana. Um, and so I think PEC Africa is involved in uh, deployment of various solar power uh, technologies for households, small and medium enterprises, and also irrigators um, in West Africa. So Joseph, um, what do you think this work on stimulating groundwater governance, is this essential to your business or is it rather a detraction from the goal of accelerating energy access for productive uses? Uh, over to you. Thank you, um, Claudia, and hello, everyone. Um, to start with, I must say that it is very, very important to us in terms of stimulating the groundwater governance, in a sense that if there is no um, groundwater, we will not be in business. We will not be able to um, provide solar water pumps. So it is very essential um, in terms of the deployment of our business model. Um, but it is interesting to know that we are also stimulating this groundwater governance in our own way. At the moment, we are piloting some pumps. Traditionally, our pumps are not able to automatically recall the amount of water that um, irrigators or the water users abstract from the ground. But currently, we are piloting some pumps um, to enable us to do this. And as part of our engagement with partners under the Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation um, Framework, um, we are collaborating with um, the International Water Management Institute to better understand the uh, results of the um, water abstracted from underneath um, the ground um, being provided by the pumps that we are, we are piloting. Um, simultaneously, we are also using the traditional water meters to be able to record um, um, water abstracted from the ground from other, other farming locations. And so these are some of the things that we are doing um, to also better understand uh, some of these results. And by engaging IUMI to analyze these results, we then feed back the results to the farmers because IUMI has the technical expertise because they would analyze it vis-a-vis -vis the crop water requirements. And then we can feed back the results to the farmers that you need to adopt this, I mean, irrigation, you know, crop, crop scheduling so that you don't over abstract uh, water from, from beneath the surface. So I would want to say that it's very, very essential to our business model because in the first place, it, it helps us to I mean, be in business. And at the same time, we also appreciate the, the crop water requirements of farmers. And for that matter, are able to let them know how to undertake the irrigation scheduling. And um, let me also point out that awareness of, of this, you know, um, managing groundwater resources among farmers, um, as far as our work is concerned, is very, 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 very low. And so it is important that we, we um, through the existing structures, our extension agents, activities of other development partners, we um, carry the message across to farmers. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. So good to know that uh, groundwater governance is also private sector uh, business and interest. It, it, uh, interest. Uh, as you correctly said, you can't sell solar pumps if groundwater resources are degraded um, and depleted. So let's move over uh, to uh, hear from Professor Seifu Kebede Gourmesa. He's with the engineering department at the University of KwaZulu Natal, and he's a renowned groundwater geologist. So from a groundwater geology perspective, Professor Kebede, what are your thoughts? about groundwater governance, a waste of time or way to the future, please, all yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Claudia, for uh, uh, inviting me. And uh, well, uh, if you had uh, asked me these questions, uh, this question like uh, 10 years ago, I would say at that stage, it was a waste of time. Uh, but uh, considering the fact that you know, so much has happened over the last 10 years. You know, the areas that you have shown us uh, from uh, e Ethiopia, 
maybe there was one one dug well by one farmer and uh, uh, at that stage we were thinking about you know how to kick start use of shallow groundwater for food production and uh, nutrition and uh, you know cash crop uh, you know cash uh, income generation etc and at that stage yeah very few farmers uh, were engaged in uh, in groundwater use so the issue was you know what should be done in terms of financing in terms of uh, availability of markets value chains what should be done technologies what should be done to to kick start groundwater use but once it starts what i've learned now is once groundwater use starts in a community it go very very quickly very very quickly so now you have hundreds of farmers tapping into into the resources and uh, uh, deplete, depleting it locally in, in many places locally depletion is uh, happening so the point here is you know when you see it from the groundwater resources uh, we have quantitative resources we have recharge storage etc there has been a lot of work uh, going on uh, at uh, Africa scale uh, also nationally when you look into the the resources there is one glaring fact and that fact is that the amount of groundwater you have is and the amount when you can put, compare the amount of groundwater you have and the amount of land you have the gro available groundwater is not sufficient to irrigate all your land so who is going to get access to the groundwater that is where you need the re regulation otherwise uh, because the available land is much larger than what groundwater could irrigate this will tell you that depletion is going to happen so how can we regulate so regulation uh, and governance is very very important so i've seen two kinds of approaches here uh, the number one is more of top-down uh, approach uh, which is not bad by itself even from the answer in uh, during the poll you could see both you know sub equal uh, some people saying the, the top you know top down which is like regulating the amount of water column uh, distance between boreholes uh, distance between dug wells is, is essential at the same time also the social uh, learning behavior change uh, is going to be very very important and uh, in, in ethiopia i don't know how how, how many minutes i have uh, so in, in ethiopia uh, there is this agricultural uh, transformation agency uh, whereby, you know, to kickstart groundwater use, uh, you know, mapping uh, of large areas up to 200,000 square kilometers of shallow groundwater has been, has taken place. And uh, as part of that mapping, some tools have been developed, for instance, uh, to regulate uh, the, the groundwater use, a farmer should be allowed to have a particular water column. In, in the dug well. And then you can regulate it, go and check that should not be exceeded. So the farmer will be, you know, uh, obliged to respect that. And uh, distance between uh, dug, uh, dug wells, you know, if a farmer has a, a dug well here, what would be the next, that where, where the next dug well should be located. And this is a kind of top down, but at the same time, it can it can work uh, because when I look also into this uh, social learning, well, some facilitation may be required. You know, who is going to be the interlocutor between uh, different uh, uh, water users? There may be other intensive uh, incentives, other reasons as to why the farmers would choose a different crop than what is the crop that is going to consume less water. So some in kind of supervision and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, facilitation is still required. And uh, on the question that, uh, so on the question that uh, the need for governance, yes, of course, it has to be adaptive governance. When in, in areas where we have to push for, you know, use, then uh, we need to apply certain te techniques, approaches when it is. Uh, depletion is imminent and happening, then uh, this kind of tools we are talking about is very, very important. And uh, I'm done here. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Kibede. So I think very interesting and useful additional insights on some of the more top-down measures. And as you said, monitoring of these more, you know, are you exceeding your groundwater column <laughs> in your well and measuring the distance to the next well, that's always interesting. I always remember being in Pakistan, you know, the largest um, contiguous irrigation project and there's lots of groundwater wells all over the place and they're not supposed to be right at the offtake right because that's where you basically just take the kennel water you know and I walk there and they're right at the offtake so, and it's all very well monitored it's very difficult really to monitor these things anyway let's move to uh, uh, Mr. Ben Ampoma he is the executive secretary of the water resources commission of Ghana um, Mr. Ampoma, what are your thoughts on the future of groundwater use in Ghana? You know, what, what can Ghana learn from India, from Ethiopia, and where do you see things going there? Will you see rapid depletion, more collective management? We've, we've heard about the challenge between river basin and individuals. What are your thoughts, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, for having me and also to make my few thoughts with respect to the potential in terms of uh, groundwater use in uh, Ghana. Uh, indeed, there is a huge potential for groundwater use in Ghana, but uh, currently the use has been largely within the domain of uh, domestic water supply. But gradually, as uh, uh, Emmanuel Obovi mentioned, is expanding to the agricultural sector and also in terms of irrigation use, especially in the northern parts of the country. Uh, the potential use is basically attributed largely to the impact that we are now experiencing with respect to climate change on our surface water resources and the uh, sources, of course, are drying up of our water bodies, surface water bodies. And uh, now people relying less and less on dams and the uh, reservoirs and also the small dams that are in use. So groundwater is relatively safe, uh, so to speak. And also, if you look at our settlement patterns within the uh, savanna areas, uh, the, it actually promotes groundwater use because of the, the way they are scattered, the communities are scattered. It's better to actually rely more on groundwater than to be uh, using uh, surface water resources. And now again, it is currently in terms of the depletion. Uh, it is currently estimated that we're using only about 5% of the groundwater that is recharged. And so for now, it seems as if we, may, we don't have a problem, but we really do have a problem in terms of seasonality, as uh, uh, above mentioned, because during the dry season, the water table really goes down. So the use, uh, the availability is not there for them to do so. The key thing that we have to resolve going forward has to do with the data and information uh, to inform proper development and use of groundwater resources. And hence the focus is really to enhance uh, research and also monitoring of the use and the use of appropriate technology in terms of uh, drilling. Uh, having said that, uh, the governance structure as mentioned as exists now it's more get at the national level uh, where we have a legislative instruments uh, defining the drilling and also the development of groundwater resources. The problem now has to how to devolve uh, these regulations to the local level and also at the basic level. So what we really want to do is to ensure to see how we can actually make this ally functional in terms of governance how people should drill and the data that they need to uh, churn out to give for purposes of the development and planning, the way they need to develop the, uh, the boreholes that they drill, the groundwater that they drill, et cetera, et cetera. How do we devolve that to the basin level and also to the community level? Surface water use for uh, agricultural purposes has some well-defined governance structure. Uh, we have uh, water use associations, et cetera, et cetera, but not so much with groundwater. Maybe we can learn from that also 
and then also moving forward uh, to learn clearly from the lessons in India and also uh, from uh, Ethiopia, where there are clear rules and regulations that have evolved from the local level and actually defining how we use the waters in terms of groundwater resources. So all in all, we really need, we can learn a lot in terms of collective action uh, and use to ensure sustainability from these two countries, that is Ethiopia and also uh, India. But in our own small way, we can also learn within how we actually govern our surface water use for uh, irrigation purposes and also to ensure that what we have at the national level is well uh, decentralized to the local and also the sub basin level. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mpuma. Really, I think, yeah, a lot of opportunities, but also likely a lot of challenges, including with climate change and the drying out of surface water bodies that you have mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I think the groundwater future will be certainly um, more challenging, even so right now only 5% of the um, recharge is being pumped back up. So, so that's good to know. Still some, I think, a lot of opportunity to consider additional activities and also some monitoring. Thing. As you said, we need more data to help manage groundwater better. Great. So let's move over to our next uh, panelist, Dr. Moffat Ngugi. He's the Agriculture Development Officer with USAID. And USAID is currently supporting a third and final phase of the Small Scale Irrigation Innovation Laboratory. The focus of this phase is on resilience and governance of small scale irrigation. Why does this matter, those two topics? Why are they so important to USAID's core operations? Uh, please, Moffat, over to you. Thank you, Claudia, and appreciating a lot uh, all, the, all the presenters so far and the audience participation. This is a very important issue. And actually it's, it, it's been re-emphasized in the new uh, global food security strategy with water resources management being elevated as a, as a cross-cutting um, uh, objective. So uh, looking at obviously a big work that we, we try to help support government and communities uh, where we work is really to increase their productivity, increase resilience, as you mentioned, Claudia, and suddenly improve nutrition. And irrigation is one of the ways uh, that we do this. Of course, a lot of traditional reliance on uh, surface flows, but looking at groundwater is, 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 is a major, major opportunity. And we do see that as a, as a, as a big future uh, opportunity, especially given uh, what we're seeing with climate change and uh, unreliability of rain, rain, rain fed. And so there's a huge discussion about tapping into the groundwater. But I think, I think as, 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 uh, as stated by Dr. Seifu and others, we cannot be able to do it really well if everybody uh, in, a, in a given community is, is over, overdrawing the water. So having some rules, having some structure is very important. And to me, this brings the question of, first of all, understanding something that uh, uh, Ben brought up in terms of, um, uh, data, understanding how much water do we really have and, and the connection between surface and groundwater, quantifying a little bit, and then understanding uh, the, the distribution across a particular, um, uh, say, a, a particular region or, or village, set of, sets of villages. And so that, that understanding that the, 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 the resource is, is very important, but then also ultimately uh, understanding uh, allocation. So that's actually what I would initially state, but looking forward to additional conversations. Thank you very much. So we'll now quickly move back uh, to India and to Dr. Sika. There was actually a question to you in the chat from uh, Kevin Peterson, I think, and he would like to know, Alok, what has been the most impactful measure across all in India uh, to rein in groundwater depletion. So yeah, if you could say a little bit more about that and also what advice would you give to our esteemed panelists from Africa? So I guess two big questions right there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I, I mean, if uh, 
I personally, based on my vast experience working in this field, I would say that if I had to say what are those three or four main uh, key learnings for groundwater management in this area is basically we have to really look into the demand side management, but of course it's easier said than done. And uh, so for that, we really need to look into the community participation and the participatory groundwater management. And uh, because without participatory process, you really cannot bring into effect in a very effective manner, the groundwater demand management. And so that is something. And then related with that also is uh, water budget-based crop planning. I mean, it's not that you do the once for all. I mean, as a, a friend from uh, FES was saying, and of course that we have been doing that even in watershed programs, that you look at the stock of water which is available to you and accordingly you kind of tailor your crop. So that's, that's another kind of a thing that we really have to look into, which is very, very important. And then uh, another thing which I always say that it is incentivization. If, you know, groundwater is something, it's interconnected. If I'm conserving groundwater, managing groundwater at my field, but my neighbors are just pulling the, sucking the groundwater out, I have no incentive. So what is the incentivization for doing the conservation of groundwater? So that is because, so that is why Claudia, as you know, that nowadays when we are talking about groundwater conservation, I mean, it is more than water when you link it with energy. Because if you conserve energy, you get paid for that, you get incentivized for that, so automatically you conserve the groundwater. So these are the kind of various learnings that which we have seen, and that's the reason, if you see the latest scheme of the government of India, which is supported by the World Bank on Atal Bhuja Lyojana, I'd say, which is around participatory approach and around demand side management. So that's the bottom line that we have to try and look into that. So now uh, coming to that, what lessons and uh, how the benefits from India can be transposed to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or Africa region as such without causing any environmental impacts. So that's something that like we wanted to know. Now, I must say that as earlier speakers and panelists have mentioned that, you know, we have seen that now the way we look at it, you see, in the times to come and in the changing climate change scenarios, we are all talking about the resilience, adaptation. Now, the best resilience in the water sector comes from groundwater because groundwater has a buffering capacity. It has a long storages, which is unaffected by climate in terms of the temperature. Of course, it will be affected by the precipitation variation. So from that point of view, we have also seen that how across the world, smallholder farmers are benefited by this groundwater management and groundwater um, uh, I would not use the word ground exploitation because it is that how best you can try and make best use of the available water resources. Now, when it comes to uh, Africa, like in Sub-Sahara and Af Africa, you know, you have enough groundwater, both the shallow renewable groundwater, uh, sufficient quantity, and also, of course, the deep. So I would say, as a, if, because I have sat on the policy planning in India and the planning commission of India, so. I would first try and look into the how best I can make best use of the shallow groundwater aquifer or the shallow water tables. So that is first thing which I'll try and do because there you can just manage with a very simple dug up, dug out wells and a small three or four or five HP pumps and motors or engines or the SIPs, the solar irrigation pump. So that should be the first target. And I know it's, it's happening, perhaps the pace and other things, but again, Along with that, on the technology side, because that's only uh, having a source argumenting, but how best you can try to uh, look into the demand management. Because as I said, the same thing I'll not repeat, but we have to see that how best we try and look into this thing, but again, in a participatory manner. The third thing, which is most of the time has been missing earlier is uh, supporting or augmenting the recharge. So whether through managed aquifer recharge or artificial recharge, 
because there are very small, small measures of rainwater recharging, which can take place even with the low cost measures. So that is what I would suppose that no matter, even if today I have a good amount of water availability, even in India also, when I'm talking in Eastern India, I say, well, because let's learn the Punjab way. So even if today we have a good amount of water, but let's try and see that we artificially recharge also the same amount. So that is something to try. Now, so these are the, from the technical, technical point of view, but again, equally important are the governance and the institutional aspects. So without that, we got proper incentivization for conserving groundwater, energy use, because here, even in Africa, you need to look into how the, we are getting the energy. Now, solar energy has come into play. Solar and one of the speakers, panelists was talking about the way we are working together with, Imi is working with them. Even Bhungroos, Bhungroos are another kind of a thing where, you know, in Africa, we have taken that from India and people are working on that. When Bhungroos are fitted with the solar irrigation pumps, and we have seen that a tremendously good amount of results, there are no over exploitation. So those are the kind of things that we have to uh, uh, kind of support the technological interventions together with the institutions, policy and the governance with the local people. And of course, we have to have uh, certain things on the top because we have to have a participatory bottom-up approach with some tinge of the top down because the policies will come from the top. So I leave it over here, over to you, Claudia. Okay, thank you very much for this, I think, very extensive uh, and, and comprehensive uh, set of suggestions to our African uh, participants. So what I've heard um, is consider groundwater re recharge, you know, regardless um, how water abandoned the groundwater um, managed area is. I'm not, a, not supposed to say exploited. Focus on shallow groundwater as, as long as, as you possibly can. Uh, be aware that it's a very special um, store uh, type of storage, particularly under climate change, because it's not affected by this uh, very rapid uh, temperature increase that we see. And of course, it's also less affected by the variability of, of precipitation, but of course it is affected by changes in the overall quantity and also the concentration effects we charge. So, and obviously really stress participatory groundwater management, but uh, don't leave politics outside and policy. If you don't have a strong policy, if groundwater management is not a priority for national governments, then it's very unlikely to ever become a priority um, for anyone else. So I think that's some of the key messages I heard, uh, I think very useful to, to our, for our, for everyone, I think on, on, on this, and uh, uh, on this webinar. I'd like to quickly move back to Ethiopia to hear a few words from uh, Dr. Fikadu Getav. As I've mentioned before, he's with the Water and Land Resources Center at Addis Ababa University and was, is directly involved in the um, pilot study um, in Ethiopia. So, you know, Fikadu, based on you, the work, you've been in the field, you've worked with the farmers, you've heard a lot of their messages. Um, what else? We've heard, you know, the governance Social learning intervention is an important measure, but it's not a silver bullet. I think that's also what the movie told us. What else do we need to do uh, to make a difference for more sustainable groundwater use? Uh, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as, as it was mentioned uh, earlier, the groundwater exploitation uh, has started recently. It started around uh, 2008, 2009, in almost all places. It, 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 it was the investors that have started uh, groundwater. They hire the land and bring their water pump and uh, they, they, they uh, cultivate. So uh, once the farmers around have seen this, this uh, as a technology, uh, they have begun to adopt it. Uh, now, uh, what limits them is the financial resource to buy water. Otherwise, every farmer uh, wants to uh, exploit. Uh, 
as, as, as uh, Dr. Sefu mentioned, the government is also promoting it uh, extensively. Even uh, the government gives them uh, water pump through credit and so on, and it extensively uh, promotes it. Uh, given the, the, the context, uh, that is the only option uh, we have currently because that area there is a high level of poverty uh, the land they have is very small uh, there is uh, high unemployment uh, so uh, it's one of one of the important technology that the government promotes uh, to increase uh, agricultural production and productivity so uh, the current level, even so the, the number of uh, water users, groundwater users are increasing, you don't see that much. Uh, the, 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 the problem is not yet happened. Uh, when you ask farmers, they say, what matters is last year's rainfall. If the, uh, there was good rainfall last year, the groundwater uh, availability is not uh, as such a problem, uh, but you you also see the ground, level of groundwater is is declining from time to time because as the number of uh, groundwater users are increasing. One 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 important thing there is uh, in all in almost all uh, survey areas there are big investors. Still, uh, much of the cultivation is, is, is done by investors. So when we uh, play this game, some risk. So uh, these investors are exploiting our, our resources. So uh, it, one way is to, to, to impose taxes, especially on, on big investors. Uh, on one hand, it will, it will reduce the use. Uh, on the other hand, it will benefit uh, the, the farmers. The other uh, possibility is, uh, as you have seen, uh, their uh, irrigation system is uh, flooding. They, they use uh, flooding system. So introducing a kind of drip irrigation may, 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 may reduce the, the, the exploitation and uh, it can contribute uh, the other uh, is, uh, as mentioned earlier, even farmers strongly suggested is to, in, to, to, to introduce, to do uh, a lot of uh, water conservation and uh, agroforestry workers to, to increase the recharge level. Uh, yeah, that is. Okay, great. So we have now heard from all of our panelists. So what I heard additionally from Dr. Vicardo is to consider to connect um, groundwater pumps with more advanced uh, on-farm irrigation technologies such as drip irrigation. Um, also focus more on watershed conservation, agroforestry practices, um, because there is clear, yeah, both water conservation upstream can support or help regulate uh, groundwater access, improve uh, availability, and um, linking, just providing the pumps on credit uh, without additional irrigation scheduling tools uh, is maybe not the ideal, um, an, an ideal process. So I would like, uh, before we go to our end poll, I'd like to give, um, yeah, to just hear from our panelists and also our presenters, if anyone would like to come in one more time in terms of where they th uh, think the future um, of groundwater governance has to go, can go. We've heard a lot of the importance of uh, combining top down uh, with bottom up measures, um, you know, but, but I, I still clearly hear that there is, you know, remains a disconnect between national policies and between what farmers are doing in the field. There's also the private sector. Uh, you know, that's really here to, to you know, 
wanting to provide technology, wanting to provide advice, but they also have to see where they fit in, both with national policy and, and with uh, farmer demands. So is there any, uh, any of our panelists who would like to um, step in for a last intervention before we go to our end poll and then close? Yeah, um, Mofat Ngugi from USAID, please. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize that, of course, as development uh, professionals, we do focus a lot on small scale farmers and for small scale production. And that's been one of the biggest challenges we have in terms of looking at food security and uh, supporting nutrition and so on. But a huge other factor really is as well, which also ties to the governance question in a country or a region is, is are the big commodities in terms of uh, especially in big uh, internationally traded commodities and the role, because usually these are big, powerful entities. They can really afford to, to draw and, and get allo allocated a lot of water. And I, I think there's, there's a question of uh, equity and justice there that kind of needs to be considered as well. So just kind of wanted to put that on the table because as discussions happen, the role for extraction and use for commodity production with with, with big international entities is, is a huge issue. I, I know, for instance, in East Africa, the, the whole issue with flowers, oftentimes they are using uh, uh, surface flow, but are we going to be seeing a situation where they're also beginning to tap that groundwater? And what does that imply for small scale holders? So yeah, anyway, yeah. that's one other dimension over. It's a great point. And I can tell you that surface flow is is uh, depleting groundwater. <laughs> it, it's it's you know, it's contributing to a, a reduction in, in recharge. There's already some, I think, little case studies in Ethiopia on that and probably elsewhere. Yeah, so equity is very important. And I think, again, that's why social um, learning interventions are important, because I think what Dr. Ficado said, we need to text those big guys, those investors. You know, that doesn't come out uh, unless you actually involve the communities to think about what solutions are needed. But then, of course, those smallholders are not the ones who can do the taxation. So I think that has to be you know, feedback up um, into the government sphere. So yeah, we have two final quick interventions. I think first from uh, Dr. Sika from EMI India and then from Joseph uh, Mensa again back to Ghana. And I think then we'll go to our closing poll. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, very, very, yeah, very quick. Uh, the, the thing, the one is that, you know, the rationalized energy provisioning, because that is a must, because we have seen the Indian experience, but because, I mean, so we have to see how best we can rationalize the energy provisioning. And if we put it saving with certain incentives, that was really going to be the uh, most important thing. The second important point uh, is uh, because as we, you were very rightly mentioning about the private market, private players, because the way it works in Africa, there's, you know, there is a much more need for a very good innovative business models. And uh, for this kind of farm island groundwater irrigation, and they are, they are there, but I think that's something that really require because because you know that i do not know because every government cannot have like everything subsidized from the government but there could be like the farmer led and then you see the private players coming into picture and so of course that would have some kind of a value chain additions and stuff like that so i think i leave it over here with these two points over to you claude yeah, thanks. Great to plant this additional seed. We definitely do need more business models and ways for farmers to engage in these productive agriculture. I mean, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region where the rural population is also still growing very rapidly. So that's very different from pretty much every other region in the world. So we actually do need to accommodate um, more, you know, larger populations in rural areas that do need to be employed in the agriculture sector because the urban areas can absolutely not absorb uh, that level of, of population growth and employment. Uh, but then of course, groundwater development can also support urban growth. But I think right now uh, we definitely need to generate more jobs in rural areas. And we had already heard, I think from Dr. Obuobi from Ghana, uh, the importance of um, groundwater irrigation to support rural employment and value chain addition. So, as our last intervention, uh, Joseph Mensa from PEC Africa, private sector 
solar um, supplier. Uh, what, what are your final thoughts, please? Yes, thanks, um, Claudia. No, as the discussions are ongoing, one thing I ask myself is how are we then also going to move forward with institutional coordination? Um, because we are doing very well, I mean, as individual institutions in trying to help with this groundwater governance. Uh, but there is a lot of um, data, for instance, that you can um, get from us as private sector in terms of um, the kind of pumps that we even recommend to um, these irrigators based on their uh, water um, table um, levels or water depth levels. And so I would want to, um, as my last words, would want to also emphasize on the institutional coordination bit, um, together with our colleagues at um, Water Resources Commission, we'd want to see more, you know, of, of, of or want to see you visible um, on the field. Um, the farmers down there are not aware, you know, of um, some of these um, initiatives, because when you speak with them, in fact, I spoke with one farmer and, um, as part of the pump that I spoke about, uh, piloting these uh, pumps that can automatically recall the water abstracted from the ground, he made me aware that he's been using um, underground water, you know, for uh, several decades. The grand grandfather, you know, the great great grandfather, <laughs> has been using the same water levels, and I mean, it's it's, it's not depleted. So I think that um, education is key. We need a lot of, you know, coordination among various actors to ensure that we all arrive at the at the same point. And as private sector, we are also more than um, um, capable of providing whatever information that we need, um, the other institutions need to help us achieve our objective of making sure that um, these um, resources underneath the surface are sustainably managed. Thanks. Okay, excellent. So I guess as a final word, we have a call right back to Ghana's government to directly coordinate and interlink with private sector, with farming communities to really jointly solve these, uh, you know, certainly growing groundwater challenges. They will not, they will not decline. I mean, India is just one example, uh, but there's also huge potential for uh, rural agriculture and economic growth. So now I would like uh, Michael to please blend in, um, show our closing poll, which is really, it's exactly the same as the opening poll. We just want to see if there has been a shift, um, behavioral change, a change in mental models, just from this particular session. What do you now think, what measures are most impactful for managing groundwater? Or, you know, given this, uh, this webinar, do we now think no measures are impactful? So please just type in again what your thoughts are uh, at the end of this session. Um, and also while people by your while you're making your choice, um, Joseph and Ben and Emmanuel, there are multi-stakeholder govern uh, multi-stakeholder processes in Ghana and also in Ethiopia, supported by the Feed the Future project to actually bring stakeholders together. My understanding is it focuses right now um, a lot on how to extend credit and how to accelerate um, access. But I think we can also add into that, we can add into that uh, a focus on governance and, and better understanding uh, between some of the concerns that farmers have and some of the solutions that government might be able to propose. So yeah, please um, uh, let's close the poll. We are one minute out to, to, ending, this, um, to ending this session. And um, okay, we see the results here. Okay, <laughs> I guess a small change in, uh, in mental models. There is a, now a stronger suggestion that it's important to support farmer rules. Um, second, we have the top-down approaches, so they, they haven't disappeared, but there's a relative uh, decline in the uh, responses in terms of focusing on, on top-down approaches and an increase in the measures to support uh, bottom-up approaches. And everyone still thinks <laughs> that we can do something about um, avoiding groundwater depletion. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks to all of our speakers. 
for these great interventions. I think it has been a super engaging session. We will make uh, all of the material, this webinar um, available online. We'll share it uh, obviously with everyone who has signed up. The movie that you have seen will be separately made available as well in case you would like to share it uh, also as an education um, and, and capacity building tool. And just, yeah, thanks again. And please do join other sessions of Africa Water and Sanitation Week. It's going on all week and there's many other sessions on groundwater. Thanks again to everyone for joining today and goodbye, goodbye. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, thank you, yeah, bye-bye, bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.